This is Twit. All right, we are going to get started here in just a second, folks, as you guys pile in. Thanks again for coming to this webinar with my friend, Mr. Jeffrey Tataro. We're going to be talking all about the hot topic of architectural photography and a little bit of real estate photography in this presentation as well. So if you've if you've ever wanted to learn what it is, what it takes to make those kind of insanely detailed and meticulously clean images that you see in Architectural Digest and all these sorts of publications. This is one of those people that makes that kind of stuff happen. So we're going to talk about all that. Jeffrey, you've been you've been doing this for a while, right? How many years have you been oh, an architectural okay. photographer? Well, I um, let's, let's see. I, I started working with another photographer, which I'll talk about later um, in 1996. So so oh, since wow. then, uh, professionally and then, you know, for for fun before that. So it's been a while. It's been a while. You know your way around an f-stop and a shutter speed, I guess, yeah. right? <laughs> For sure. Well, well, I'm not going to take up too much time because we, we've reviewed the presentation before we even started the webinar, and there's so much good stuff in there. I don't want to take any of the time away from uh, from the presentation delivery. But a little bit of housekeeping before we get started, folks. So feel free to interact and chat and all that stuff in there while the webinar is going on. But if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A area. Uh, you'll see it down below on the right in the Zoom interface. And and towards the end of the webinar, we'll leave some space for Q&A. So if you have some questions about what Jeffrey's talking about, as they pop up in your head, just throw them in the Q&A and then I'll take those one by one and fire them at Jeffrey and he'll answer those at the end. And then also, we don't. This Week in Photo doesn't have a course or anything associated with architectural photography yet. We're working on one, but we don't have one yet. But if you are into this genre or interested in learning more about it, Jeffrey, you have a, you have a course that's actually coming up or a, a workshop, a virtual yep. workshop that's coming up next week. Tell us a little bit about that before we jump into the presentation. Uh, sure. Thanks, Frederick. Uh, yeah, I, I teach this uh, this workshop um, uh, once a year and it's uh, it's normally in person down in Palm Beach, Florida. But uh, th this year and last year, we're doing it uh, virtually. Still runs through the Palm Beach Photographic Workshop at uh, workshop.org. And we're actually running it next week, uh, Tuesday through Friday. Uh, it's a four day workshop online. Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, you can get in touch with me or, or get in touch uh, through their website, workshop.org. Come on. Perfect. In. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll link to that in the, the replay okay. notes for this when this goes out to you folks. If you're, if you're, if you're watching this, you're going to get the replay notification. So you'll have that link in there if you want to go check that out. Sounds great. All right. And that's it. Uh, without further delay, I'll hand it over to you, Mr. Totaro. The, the stage okay. is yours. Thanks very much. Frederick, thanks a lot for, uh, for having me uh, on the show once again. You're and it's always a pleasure to come and, and chat and talk about, um, talk about what I do. Uh, so I will share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. So uh, I have this presentation ready to go here, see if it's going to cooperate. Yes, it is. So I like to start things out by uh, telling you what we're going to talk about. Uh, so you have an idea where we are in the presentation and what we're going to talk about. So I'll go over a little bit about how I got started in architectural photography and my background uh, in architecture. And we'll talk also about, you know, what is architectural photography, uh, the goals of it, and also some, some uh, inspirations of mine. Then we'll get into uh, related topics of, of perspective and camera choices and perspective control, which is always important. And I'm still a big proponent of lighting. Uh, I started in the film days uh, where lighting was absolutely crucial. And I've definitely translated uh, into using lighting uh, for digital as well. So we'll talk about when and why. And although mostly I use strobe in my work these days, I do have a nice example of, of um, using hot lights. Uh, and it's a good example of also just the control you might need to, to pull off a a shot at dusk. Then I'm going to talk about uh, Capture One and Photoshop. I'm just going to go over a few quick tools. This isn't really meant to be a, a webinar uh, on full-on post-production, but there's a couple of tools in Capture One that I really like, and also one that is a, a plug into Photoshop that I used all the time, and not really sure where I'd be without it. So I wanted to just give you a quick overview of that. So uh, if there's, um, there may certainly be more questions about that, but those are the kind of things we cover more in detail in, in the workshop and things. And then if there's time, I'll, I'll just run through a bunch of, of finished photos, uh, just to, to illustrate a few points. So we'll kick things off. So, um, 
I studied uh, architecture and engineering at Drexel University uh, with full intent of becoming an architect. Uh, it seemed like a good a good background to have, in, and especially with engineering. And it had always been an interest of mine. I always loved building, design, and construction. Um, at, you know, as a kid, or just trying to understand how all these things worked. So I went to uh, I went to Drexel and studied uh, architectural engineering, which is uh, basically all the building systems that keep a building. Uh, standing and, and operating uh, structural engineering primarily is what my degree is in. And Drexel has a cooperative education program. Uh, and so for three of the five years I was in school, I worked uh, six months out of the year for a large firm in Philadelphia. So and doing a huge variety of things in their office because I was a student, but um, I settled on. So five years after I graduated from college, I worked for them for, for five full years um, doing mostly architectural related things. And then my last two years was all in structural engineering. But about halfway through that five year period after college, I got really, really interested in architectural photography. I'd always been into photography and learned, uh, you know, learned like most people on a, a SLR camera. Mine was a Canon AE-1 that actually belonged to my cousins. And then it may seem a little bit strange, but it was it was actually the four by five view camera uh, when I discovered that, that really kicked into high gear for me. And it wasn't because, oh, this is a cool camera. It was more like, this is really the tool that is gonna allow me to do what I wanna do in photography. Cause you know, just waving around a handheld 35 millimeter camera just wasn't doing it for me. I really, what I didn't know I was missing was the perspective control. And that's what the four by five camera gave me. So as I learned more and more about architectural photography and, and the view camera, I started to figure out like, how am I going to make this happen? This, I want to, I want to do this as a full-time thing. So I got to know some photographers that were doing work for the office I worked for. And, uh, one of them was Tom Crane. Uh, and he offered me a, a position back in, he offered me a position in 1995 and I started working there in 1996. So it's been, been quite a while. Uh, but it was a, one of those once in a lifetime opportunities. Uh, so I felt like I, I would have regretted it forever had I not taken it. So uh, Tom was very gracious to me and uh, learned tons and tons of things from him. And, and he really helped me also develop in, into having my own business, which is very gracious of him. So let's talk about architectural photography and, and you know, who were my clients? So mostly, uh, mostly I'm shooting for architects and designers or anyone involved in the building trades. Uh, could be, um, you know, could be contractors, could be manufacturers of, of products, uh, you know, floors, windows, anything like that. And I always like to say it's a very specialized skill set because there's like any genre of photography, there's, there's definitely things that come up all the time that you get used to dealing with. So, uh, there are many, many things in the architectural photography world that, that we get, uh, we get quite good at, at handling. And that's really part of what I like about, uh, architectural photography is there's, you have control over certain things, but there are certain things you don't have any control over. And so it's always a challenge to figure out, well, how are we going to, how are we going to figure this out? And that was a, a quite honestly a bigger problem in the film days because there was no no forgiveness afterwards. And uh, we'll go, we'll talk more about cameras specifically, but I I, I use medium format digital, uh, and uh, having used four by five film for so many years, uh, when digital came along, I was, I was very interested in keeping uh, in camera perspective control, which in the early days of digital uh, was was quite limited, uh, one or two perspective control lenses at those times. And even then they were on crop sensors. So that was, uh, that was very difficult. Uh, so I, I, when the time came, I was able to, to jump into, uh, um, uh, one of phase one's first, uh, P series backs, the P 25 and putting that on a nice Arca Swiss camera, very tedious to focus, but, but it worked out well. And like I said before, we, we still use lighting quite a bit that many people say like, Oh, with digital, you don't need to light things. Right. And I would say there are many circumstances where we, we light uh, more than we might have had the opportunity to light when we shot film. And you'll find me referring a lot to the film days. And uh, it's not just because I'm old. It's, it, I, I think the perspective of knowing how things were done before and how things are done now and merging those two thought processes together is, is certainly very helpful. So uh, I'll show a little bit about, about lighting. Uh, one, one slide in particular, I think is, is super helpful. Uh, there are many reasons to, to light things. And architectural photography uh, is definitely different than real estate photography. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. So what I like to say is the difference 
uh, between architectural photography and real estate photography is mostly about the audience, right? It's who are the photos for? So in my case, uh, most of my clients are architects and they're using these photos uh, basically to record their work, their life's work in a lot of cases. And so that's very important to them. They, they want uh, the photos to live on. So the, the, the project they work on, they complete it. They may or may not interact with that project uh, in the physical world uh, after it's handed over to the client. But the photographs are the thing that they take away from it. So they have uh, photographs in their archives. Uh, a lot of you know, larger firms, even smaller firms, do monographs, which are just a, basically a history of their work uh, over a certain period of time. So the, the photographs are certainly very, very important because uh, architects being, being uh, mostly you know, artists at heart, they're certainly very passionate about what they do, and they put loads and loads of time and energy into their work, and they want to have a, have a good record of it. And so when you think about a, a real estate transaction and real estate photography, those photos are mostly just there to help facilitate um, the sale of a house, for instance. So, and once that house is sold, those photos may not really have much of a purpose. They're still good photos. They're good photos for the photographer's portfolio. Perhaps the new homeowner uses them, something like that, but they don't have a lot of life beyond that. And so when we think about the difference between the, you know, the realtor and the architect, it's just a matter of, of, of what their purpose is for the photos is, what are they going to do with them and what's, what's sort of their life expectancy in a sense. And when you think about architects needing to also promote their work, the photos are going well beyond their office. They're going out to award submissions, editorial submissions, uh, any other, and these days, you know, a myriad of, of different blogs on architecture and things. So the, the photos are, are out there, are just they're the architect's calling card. So it's very, very important. And none of this is meant to disparage the work that real estate photographers do because it's, they're doing very difficult work because they're, they're often under a much more difficult schedule than we are as architectural photographers. They may be shooting one or two or three homes in a day. And that's certainly trying. And also the, the turnaround is quite quick. Uh, the realtors want the photos back right away. So as architectural photographers, we're definitely afforded more time in the sense to not only do the shoot, but also uh, spend enough time in post to really refine things. And so on a, for instance, on a, on a full day shoot, we may do maybe full day office interior shoot, maybe do like 10 shots, uh, something like that with a, a handful of people involved um, between me and my assistant and the client and whoever they might bring uh, versus a uh, real estate shoot where maybe there's, I don't know, 25 shots uh, per house or something and they have to be turned around in a day or two. So it's just a very difficult schedule to, to meet. So that's why I say we're sort of afforded more time. Our clients say, all right, we want to, we want to make sure these photos are as good as they can be. So we're going to, we're going to work at the pace that, that helps to reach those goals. Oops, there we go. So like I was talking about, the, the photos are very important for the architects. And me as a photographer, it's important that I, I identify what the essence of the project is. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean putting on the widest lens I can find to show the whole thing. It may be putting on a much longer lens just because that's really where, where the essence of the project might be in a particular shot. So that's my goal is to help translate and uh, translate the architect's design uh, for, the, for the rest of the world to see. And this important point I like to make, I consider the whole process a, a collaboration between me and the client because they're much more familiar with all of the, the little design details and things that they put into the project. Uh, so something they spend a lot of time on, I may not be aware of right away. So I'm always asking like, you know, tell me a little bit more about, about what the goals of the project were from, from you and your client's perspective. What are the things we need to uh, address and trying to thread a story together? So I, I really like to be able to, to walk the viewer the photos through uh, so they can sort of get a sense of how the building is put together and, and how it flows. So I need to gather that information from the client. There are some photographers I've heard from my clients that they've worked with where the photographers don't want any input from the architects. And I'm like, yeah, you can shoot like that. And I can certainly make some nice photos, but I'm, I, I put my, I check my ego at the door in the sense I'm like, I'm there to, to, to create some really nice photos that are useful to the client. So that's just, that's just how I approach it. And if there's an opportunity for me to do a shot, you know, for myself or something, then maybe I'll do that too. But my primary goal is to, to be there to get them useful photos for their portfolio. Uh, and sort of the obvious thing here is that the translation of a, um, 
a building into two dimensions. And I find that that's an important point. It's obvious, but it's an important point because it gets to, it speaks to the idea of how do you work with, uh, with especially with wide angle lenses uh, to accomplish translating something and trying to minimize distortion and, and also making a compelling photograph. So next I wanna speak about uh, some inspirations of mine uh, throughout the years when I uh, went to uh, Amsterdam um, many years ago, actually to visit the Cambo factory and uh, discovered this painter. And you can see the dates here. Uh, so this guy's been around for, for quite a long time or was around quite a long time ago, I should say. Uh, and one time I showed this slide and somebody said, oh, he must use the camera obscura. And it, it came to my attention that he did not use the camera obscura. So these are all, all drawn at a time when perspective was, was uh, not very well understood. But I just love this. This is a, we'll talk a little bit more about perspective. This is a one point perspective uh, kind of a, a, a painting. And I just think he really captures uh, the scale of the building. I love how he uses people. Um, and then on, more into the modern era, these uh, more mid-century uh, a photograph by uh, Ezra Stoller, who is considered to be one of the sort of uh, grandfathers of architectural photography. Um, and you may be familiar with photographers that work under the uh, the Esto name. So this was that was his uh, his creation. Uh, I worked with them briefly uh, for a couple years back in 2006. But these are all shot, uh, as far as I understand, on eight by ten film and then black and white, um, you know, very intentionally. This is the TWA terminal, which was just turned back into, or was turned into a hotel a few years ago. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, Julius Schulman, uh, shot a lot of the beautiful homes out in Los Angeles uh, in the middle of the last century. Used a lot of, he managed to use people a lot in the film days, uh, which was much more difficult uh, in terms of expo length of exposure. So he used a lot of strobe to try and freeze the people. Uh, this is a very iconic shot of his looking over Los Angeles. So I just want to get into briefly just sort of the, the nuts and bolts of perspective, because I think it's important to understand a little bit about this because we are, uh, we're creating uh, perspectives all the time. And with the, the use of the technical camera that I use or with shift lenses on a, on a SLR camera or mirrorless camera, uh, it's, it's very important to, to understand uh, what perspective is. So, I like to think about the similarities of between photography and drawing, uh, especially in something called a one point perspective, because it looks very much like an architectural drawing and, uh, one point perspectives are most often done in a symmetrical way. Uh, so what is one point? It means that if you were to draw lines, um, from, uh, to, to basically the lines along the perspective of the shot would all vanish into a single point in the center of the shot. So in this case, it's a symmetrical uh, idea here, but I'll show you some that are not so symmetrical. So again, here's the, here's the photograph that illustrates that, which is a uh, you know, camera right in the center of the space. And you can get an idea of the, the lot, the perspective lines all coming toward the center, a center point there. This isn't something you think about like, Oh, where is that point so much? It's just a matter of understanding, uh, what the feel of the shot is. So this is also a one point perspective. Uh, so very much easier to see the lines of, of perspective converging toward the center here, but this is what, you know, an asymmetrical composition. And the, I really like when, when these kind of things come together and it can be, uh, can be a very, very, um, pleasing result. I just like the way this tree is in relation to the building. So, uh, one point perspectives are pretty much my favorite. I, I really like the way they feel in terms of feeling like, like an architectural drawing. And it's a nice way to square up the camera to the building and let the energy of the building do the rest of the work. Uh, I think it's just a nice, simple way. And I think it does the most justice to, uh, to a design. Uh, and then briefly two point. So two point perspective, I'm hoping you can see my mouse, uh, is when the, the perspective lines, um, uh, vanish into two separate points. And those points are very often outside of the shot. Unlike the one point perspective where that point is always within the shot. We can see your mouse, by the way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's just a, a simple drawing of a two point perspective. And then here's an idea of a, of that in a photograph. So if you can imagine the lines here vanishing off to this side, and this is a good point where that, that line, uh, the point is well outside the frame of the photo, but that's a simple example of a two point perspective. 
then there's also a three-point perspective. So this is a, a composition technique that we don't use very often as architectural photographers, because you can see that that three-point perspective means that all of the uh, vertical lines of the buildings are all converging uh, towards some imaginary point in the sky. So this is what we would call keystoning. Uh, and it's there are times when you might use it as a, it deliberately, but it's often something that as architectural photographers we're trying to avoid. So uh, this I think this drawing illustrates it uh, pretty well. So as architectural photographers, we'd be trying to straighten up all those lines and get them get them all squared up. And in my next slide, uh, I like to show this in relation to that three point because the the shot on the left. The same, it's the same as the shot on the right, but the shot on the left was done as a scouting shot. So this is where I leave the fancy camera at home and I just have a handheld camera and we're just looking around with the client trying to understand which views we like of the building and things we have to sort out before the shoot. So we did the scout and the next day the client's like, oh, can we use that photo? Uh, the one you took from the corner because uh, their client wants to use it for something and no one told them. So. Uh, because I use a camera that always has perspective correction in camera, it's rare that I do perspective corrections in software, but they can be completely done in software um, just fine. So in this case, we've taken this 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 shot that had a basically a three-point perspective to it and turned it into one that has more of a two-point perspective in post. So, and we did some other cleanup, but I just like to show that that's uh, a good example of the difference between like a three-point uh, perspective and taking away the keystoning effect so that we have uh, we have a, what I would call a, a, a proper presentation of an architectural photograph. Uh, and then from here, I think it's a good time to talk about camera systems um, because we're talking about perspective co control and correction. So um, the system I use, like I said, is, is phase one and I use uh, this camera on the left is the phase one uh, plus camera, which is a generically called a, a technical camera. And this gives you not only the, the sort of shift control that you might have with a shift lens on a, a mirrorless camera, but also allows um, so you can shift the lens and the back can also move um, left and right. So you have what I call compound movements uh, on the on the camera versus a, a shift lens where maybe you have to rotate the barrel to shift up and over to the right a little bit at the same time to see over two you don't have you don't have individual control of, the, of those axes so that's the sort of workhorse camera i use the phase one uh iq4 150 uh digital back which is uh really incredible they've come such a long way from the p25 that i had um, many years ago and then on the right is another alpha body which is the, um, they call the SWA, just a smaller, uh, smaller, lighter weight camera. Uh, and then at the bottom, these are the uh, uh, other two systems that we use. I use a, a Leica SL2, which is my uh, sort of daily second system and backup system. So we'll often use uh, the Canon 24 and 17 shift lenses on this, on this body. And also we recently got into the, the Fujifilm uh, medium format system. Uh, as well. So let's talk about a little bit about other systems because there are certainly many, many choices these days. And there's no reason that you need to be using, um, that you can't do competent work with, with an SLR uh, or a mirrorless camera with the shift lenses. I just really like medium format. Like I said, I shot four by five film and it felt very, um, just very natural to get into a system that, that allowed me to continue with that. Because like I said, Earlier, it was the 4x5 camera that really allowed me to sort of visualize things the way that I was seeing them. So I like to stay with that. Uh, and you certainly can make corrections in post. I just showed you that one, one example. Uh, so a little bit more about this system here. There's those two cameras that I use. Just another shot of that one. Um, so those were more of their website photos. These are This is actually my system out in the field. So uh, the plus camera, the back, one of these new lenses with the phase one X shutter, it's a whole new shutter system that's connected with the black cable to the back. Um, Alpa's uh, lens shade system. And I always shoot tethered. The orange cord there is tethered to the laptop where 99.5% of the time we're shooting tethered. And the gizmo on top is the Profoto strobe uh, remote. 
Just the this is the SWA out in the field with the 23 millimeter lens, um, and this one's on the uh, Arca Swiss uh, D4 head. This is an unusual setup. This is using the same Alpha 12 Plus and the digital back, but using uh, Canon's 17 millimeter shift lens uh, that, that I can mount to this camera. And you may be wondering, well, how's it possible that it even covers medium format because it's a much bigger sensor? So fortunately they do because those, those lenses are designed with a large enough image circle um, that it does cover medium format. You don't have a ton of movement, but uh, it's basically a 17 millimeter medium format lens, which is quite wide and use, use uh, sparingly. Uh, just quickly, phase one makes a, a great system as well. So the same shutter system and actually the same lens is just branded differently. Uh, and this is their body made by Cambo, which has some really nice design features to it. Um, definitely small, and a little bit of their lens range. Uh, 23, 32, and 70, they have a few more lenses available now. But more commonly, you'll find people using these lenses, uh, Canon's 24 uh, and 17 tilt shift, or Nikon's 19 millimeter. Uh, these are common lenses used by architectural or real estate photographers, and they're, they're quite good. I think these lenses, I, I feel like they're losing money on these lenses, like they probably should cost a lot more because they're quite good. Uh, so I think, I think that they're, they're really, really good designs. So I'll talk uh, briefly about lighting. So the goal when I'm using lighting is really just to, to be able to make the viewer, um, and the camera see what you see with your eye. Cause the eye is way better at seeing in the shadows and highlights than, uh, than a camera is, uh, we'll often add, um, accents or, or pops of light in order to draw the eye somewhere. I have one example of that, if we can get to that one. And we're often blending uh, daylight and other existing lights or blending our, our strobe light with daylight, uh, adding light for mood uh, to try and either preserve or create uh, a certain mood in a shot. And like it's, we've talked about before, the uh, I definitely think lighting is still required for digital. Uh, basically two different lighting systems. We use strobe when we have a lot of daylight. Uh, and much more rarely now do I use hot lights, but that would be in an environment where there's pr predominantly already tungsten light and not much daylight, if, if any, uh, just because it's more difficult to control. The hot lights give you a much more precise uh, placement of the light. The strobe is much more broad. So hot lights, you end up needing a lot more actual light fixtures um, because your one light might just be lighting the back of one chair and maybe there's 10 chairs. So you have to use many, many different lights. Uh, and yeah, when would you use strobe? So when it's predominantly daylit, um, you can, the strobes can compete much better with, with bright windows um, that matches the color of daylight better. If you're shooting people and you're trying to keep them still, um, strobe helps. If you're trying to shoot people and have them blurry, strobe does not help. Um, and the nice thing about strobe too, is that the exposure being all based on aperture and not shutter speed, you can use in very creative ways to, uh, to help capture enough pieces that can make your compositing, uh, a, a lot easier and also to control reflections in certain surfaces. Um, hot lights, I won't spend too much time on that, but it's just, uh, you can easily see what you're getting because the hot lights are just on. You can see your results uh, very quickly. So why am I using lighting? It's, and I like to say this, it's control, control, control. So it's all about being able to either make my life easier in post or to make the photo better because we're adding some, some texture and color and shape to things. Uh, we can easily control bright windows. We can control glare and textures, and we can control this balance of ambient and strobe. Uh, difficult to describe in, in, in a brief webinar, but that's a, that's a very important point about using strobe. So I'm just going to show this one slide here, which I think, uh, can illustrate very well what, um, the advantage of using, of using lighting. So on, on the left here, an exposure that's at F11 at six seconds. So imagine you're shooting this, this room, dark wood paneling against a bright window and you don't have any lighting. You're like, well, I'll just do a bunch of brackets and we'll pull it together and post. And yeah, you could do that. But let's think about that. So you have to, you're already losing detail here in, in a lot of the woodwork. The window's obviously blown out. Also, you have dark wood shades in front of the window. That would be uh, a lot more tedious to handle in post. So uh, in not much time at all, you could set up a light. I think this one was bounced in the ceiling. And I'm just, you know, just zoomed in here for an example. 
Uh, but you can see, so from six seconds down to a quarter second, that's quite a gap uh, that you'd have to blend in post. So I already, I, in one shot, I have a good window exposure and I have plenty of light and texture on the wood. So I think that should convince you that lighting is definitely helpful. Uh, and that's why we use it a lot, especially against the uh, dark walls against a bright window. This is the kind of thing that we go into depth much more in, um, in the workshop I teach and uh, how to implement these kind of things. So just a couple of uh, fun examples here. Here's, um, this is actually a, a fake sunlight pattern brought in from outside with a strobe head. And this is the same exposure, same ambient exposure, just without the uh, strobe firing. So you can see the, the difference there is, is dramatic. We have a lot of strobe also inside on the right side of the shot. So the strobe also cleans up the color. The color is very consistent throughout this. The wall, the wall paint is very, very consistent. The cabinet color is very consistent. Because again, shooting for designers, architects, interior designers, if the color looks wonky, it's it's not going to go over well. There's that again. Even in this dark shot, you can see that the paint color is lots of variation. Picks up reflections from outside, blue sky, green grass. Can get messy. Uh, in this shot, uh, I'm going to just walk through quickly a... Uh, a little bit about uh, the process we use in trying to pull off a shot like this at dusk. This is an interior dusk shot, and then I'll show a quick exterior dusk shot. So this is the finished shot. This is a building in Philadelphia. I was actually shooting for the developer of the building, and this is like a model unit. So they said they wanted a dusk shot with a nice city view. And so I thought, well, that's, that's fine. We can do that. Uh, I knew that the building didn't have any good window shades. So the challenge is when you get to a, a shot like this, is you have to get there. You can't walk in right at this right, right right at this particular time when it's dusk time. So you have to show up much earlier. So this is two or three hours before that um, that particular time of day when when dusk is optimal. So when we get there, there's tons of daylight pouring in. We can't really evaluate the lighting in the room uh, in order to figure out what we have to light. And as it starts getting darker, we're going to run out of time uh, in terms of how much lighting we still have to do because uh, the daylight's just contaminating the whole thing. So we just threw up without any care for being particular, just huge sheets of black plastic just to cover the windows. So if there were window shades, we could have done that with window shades. But now we've darkened the room close to what it's going to look like at dusk. Now we can see the light that's going to be in the room, you know, an hour or two from um, be or before we're going to shoot. So now we can start lighting it. So we've added some lights here. I won't spend too much time on what lights exactly. but So we're starting to light it, playing around with the furniture a little bit. Tried this piece of furniture over here, didn't like it, put it back in the kitchen. Changed the camera height a little bit, moved the chair around a little, added some more lights. So now we're getting to the point where, all right, it's starting to get darker outside. And so now we can take down the plastic. Now, this shot, come on back up, this shot and this shot, sorry, there are uh, essentially, you know, the, the, the lighting we've added is still on in this shot. You just can't see it as well because there's too much daylight. So it's all there. It's just waiting now for it to get darker. So here it is now. So this is one of the sort of you know working exposures uh, that's getting very close to the optimal time for dusk. Now you can see our lighting effect. You're starting to get some nice dusk glow in the building. Oh, sorry, in the windows. And then the next slide is just the finished shot again. So that's um, just a, a very, very quick walkthrough of the process that we would use for a shot like this, which requires getting there early enough planning out uh, a lighting strategy and being able to evaluate our lights before we lose the opportunity to get this particular time. So just um, just a, a quick example of that. So this I say patience. So here's an exterior dusk shot. This is uh, Under Armour down in Baltimore for um, uh, BCJ Architects. So I say patience in this shot because it's very helpful if you can afford the time and maybe you don't have 10 shots to do at dusk. It's nice to dedicate yourself to one shot uh, or at least one camera to one shot. Often we'll set up multiple cameras. So um, this is just an early shot before, you know, just getting the camera set up. Nothing, nothing magical happening yet. Um, so here, a few minutes later, now the sun's starting to go down. We got this really nice sunset, but the building lights haven't come on yet. So that's a shame. We're going to miss that, um, that sky. And then we'll hear the lights have come on, which they look great. And it's a nice sky, but it's not the dramatic sky that we had before. But since we haven't moved the camera, it's just sitting there on a tripod, um, we can blend it together and create this kind of a shot. 
So yeah, a little bit of a cheat for the sky, but it, we would have gotten this very similar shot had the building lights been on earlier. It's just that they didn't happen to come on in time. So uh, at this point, I'm going to switch gears. So I'm going to stop this share. Hey, Jeffrey, while you're switching yeah. gears there on, on that last shot you showed with yes. the, you know, bringing in the sky with the, with the lights in the building, mm -hmm. did, how, did you just manually mask the sky in or did you use like, like a sky replacement tech? Like how did you get it so perfect? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, it's been a couple of years since I did this one. I would say this was before I started using sky replacement and I probably just passed it out. Okay. Um, oh, wow. By hand, out. huh? Wow. Yeah. I mean, the, the lights up here, they don't have much detail in them. So I think they probably just were included in that. And it's not really that much. It's like, you know, anyone who's cut a path in Photoshop, this is not too bad. And the tree is part of the sky. So that's helpful. Yeah. The joy uh, of Bezier curves, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this one, I don't think would have been too difficult, but there's, um, I, I have started using some sky replacement techniques and that's, um, those are helpful. And that would have been a very good candidate for this for sure. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me just switch over now. I'm going to, so what I would like to do is I'm going to switch over to capture one and maybe you guys can respond in the chat. Um, who uses capture one versus Lightroom? just out of curiosity in terms of um, saturation of product. So this is um, a shot that I think is a good example of this one technique. So in Capture One, I'm not gonna go through all of Capture One here because there's just way too much to talk about in a, in a brief webinar, excuse me. But I wanted to just show a little bit about some of the color tools and masking tools, which we can do in, in this one shot here. And then I'm going to show one other tool I really like in Capture One that I use constantly. And then we'll transition into Photoshop where I'll show you something else I use uh, quite often. So this was a, a shot, uh, I think at uh, Lehigh University, I think. So let me, um, let me see. I'm going to actually have to make my screen a little smaller because there's some Zoom stuff in the way here. Okay. So, uh, so this shot as it stands, where's my layers? That's what I wanted to show. Yeah, let's start from here. So Capture One has some uh, tools that, that can be used with layers, which is really nice. Sorry, I just made that go away. So what I want to show you is a quick color tool, which is called the Color Editor. Uh, Capture One is organized in a very simple way with different tool tabs here. But the color editor is nice because you can you can pick a color that you want the tool to operate on. So I'm just using the, the color picker. And it shows you here uh, what range that color is in, and you can make some adjustments to, to that. But if you wanted to say you like the shot, but you want a little more color in the sky, you can just start to saturate the color, for instance, and you get, you get a pretty nice result from that, except that it's also saturating sort of the reflection of blue that's in the metal panels here. And... I don't really like that so much. I'd like to keep it isolated to the sky. So there's a way to do that. So we can still use the selection, we have the, the color selection that we made with the color editor tool, but we can turn it into a, a mask. And then with the mask, we can then sort of reapply uh, the color editor tool in a, in a more refined uh, selection. So what you do here is you can create a masked layer from that selection. And before I do that, just briefly down here, I can check this box. So hopefully it's coming through. You can see mostly that the red gets really desaturated because I'm saying view selected color range. So you can sort of see all the blue that's been selected there. So again, I'll go to uh, create masked layer from selection. It'll take a second. So in the layers palette here that I, I just sort of pulled out, oops, I went away again. The layers palette, uh, you have the background layer and then you have this adjustment layer. So if you were to hit the M key, M for mask, uh, you can see where that mask is being applied and it equals exactly the, the blue that we selected in the last step. But now you're like, well, how do we get rid of this? So you, you could come in here with, um, for instance, with an eraser tool and you could start erasing the mask, but then, you know, as you, you have to sort of follow around all these edges really carefully and that's just going to be tedious and not, not really worth the trouble. So it'd be nice if there was a, a more refined way to refine the mask. So a few versions ago, Capture One added this thing called Luma Range. So keep in mind, we initially made this mask 
by selecting blue. And now we're gonna refine the mask a little bit more by the brightness values. So this Luma range tool already has a, a little bit of a feather at the shadow end and at the highlight end. Uh, so I'm gonna already say, well, I want all of the highlight stuff because I know I want the brighter sky stuff selected and I, I don't want some of the darker stuff selected. So I'm just gonna slide this over and nothing much has changed up top, but let me pull this down here and slide this up here a little bit. So what you can do now is start to pull the shadows down. So by pulling the shadow sliders to the right, you're asking the mask to, to just let go of anything that's in the shadows. And you can start to see it happening here so it's starting to sort of release, if you will, some parts of the mask. Now you can start, I'm just going a little too far because you can start to see it's starting to take the mask away from the sky. So that's too far, but somewhere right around there is pretty good. And what it's done is there's still some other parts that are selected, but those are much easier to erase, but it's really very finely picked up the edge of the building. And that is, is a nice, important part that you want to hang on to, to in terms of where that mask is. And all down here, it's nicely selected around the trees, nicely selected. So you apply that mask. Uh, and then you could come in and maybe just erase out some of the parts. So they, and again, these are much easier to erase because you don't have to get too close to the building edge. And these are parts I just want to take out. Uh, I'm not going to bother to do the whole thing here. So we basically just made a really nice, simple selection. It didn't take all that many steps. I'm going to hit the M key again. So now what we can do is we can go in and apply the, when I'm on the adjustment layer, I can now apply the, the color editor tool again. It's basically making the same blue selection, but now it's, it's only on what's, what's on layer one. And then from here, you could, for instance, I'll just overdo it a little bit so you could see it, but you would maybe start to overdo the saturation. It does start to get a little haloing in there sometimes, and there's some things you can do in Luma Range to refine the mask a little bit. So that's not as prominent, but I really overdid that. That's why it's showing so much. So again, you can just see here. So you can very quickly, just within the one raw file, make some adjustments uh, like that. So that's a tool that we use uh, a lot, the color editor. It's nice to... Um, to come in like, I don't know, maybe you wanted to saturate the brick a little bit more or something, you can make another selection. And it will start to stack the selections. If you make multiple selections, you'll see all the different colors down here. So you could say you wanted to saturate that a little bit more. Uh, you could go through and, and do selective color adjustments, which are really, really helpful. Uh, and then I wanna show you another tool you use constantly is something called Normalize in Capture One. Let me get rid of this. Don't worry about that one. Let me find out where I put normalize. Here it is. So this is a tool that is super helpful if you want to, if you need to match color between two shots or two parts of a shot. So, um, excuse me. Uh, very often in commercial spaces or even homes, there'll be a carpet that's like throughout one shot or it might be throughout every shot so it's got to look consistent from shot to shot that's um that's what we do as professionals so the color has got to be very consistent so uh sorry i want a smaller screen here let me move some tools around so in this shot and it may not be that big a deal to most of you but the, the carpet on this side is much bluer than it is on the right and it's that's because this building has like terrible little mini blinds that so we put the blinds down but they're those little mini blinds um, that don't really close very tightly. So there's still a lot of blue sky that's reflecting down onto the gray carpet. Uh, so we have two different selections here. Let me, actually, let me just do something here. Hold on. I'm just gonna clone this one. So we have two shots, basically just a clone of the first shot. So what I want to show you is I'm going to sample a color from the right side and make the left side into that color. And then we'll be able to blend them together in Photoshop. So what I want to do is show you, so that's the, the two shots. Now I'm going to slide the viewer over so you can see now how much different those colors are, right? Significant difference. So in the normalize tool, you basically select a source color and then you apply it. 
It's very simple. And you can either do it just with color uh, or just with exposure. Say you wanted to match an exposure um, more precisely between two shots, or you could do uh, color and exposure at the same time. So for this example, I'm just going to use color. So what I want to do is pick, I'm going to pick something in the carpet here, like maybe one of the whiter pieces of the carpet. And I'm just going to sample that. And it gives you the RGB values up here, which is helpful. Uh, now I'm going to pick the apply tool and I'm going to come over to a white area of the carpet. And so now those two carpets, uh, they, they look slightly different because you're it's viewing the carpet from a different angle. But now the colors match much, much better. But watch what happens here. You're, I think you'd agree that those match pretty well. But watch what happens when you view the whole shot. So now you'd be like, boy, that one on the left doesn't, that looks way too warm. I can't imagine that that's the right color. Um, but when you zoom in, it, it sure is the right color. So I always recommend when you're doing these kind of adjustments to really get in tight because the rest of the shot will throw your eye off completely. So uh, this is a tool we use constantly in many different scenarios, but that's a, a really good example of it. So what I'm going to do next, let me see if I had it in here. I don't, so I'm just going to run those real quick. So I'm going to output these files. Uh, I'm going to take them into Photoshop, and I'm going to introduce you to a tool that we use all the time. Um, and it's made by a guy named Greg Benz, who was on Frederick's show. Uh, he's been on a few times. He was on just recently. He makes a really great uh, plugin for Photoshop called Lumenzia, which um, I'm just exporting these out to Photoshop now. Lumenzia is a really powerful tool, and it would take 10 webinars to really get into it. Um, but what's used and shown very often are how, uh, and this is the Lumenzia panel. There's two different ones, a basics panel and the, the full on Lumenzia panel here. So mostly what you can do is make, um, here it's asking me to convert to 16 bit. I'm just doing this in eight bit just to show you. Uh, thank you. What happened? There we go. Uh, so mostly you can make what are called luminosity selections and I'll just briefly show you what that looks like. So I'm hitting the L here for lights. You got lights, mids and darks. Uh, Greg has loads of good tutorials on his website. And then you can use the slider here. Uh, this is a slightly updated interface. Uh, so you can say, well, I'm going to go down to L lights two, and it, then it starts to constrain. So what looks like just a black and white photo here is actually a mask it's going to generate. And the things that are white are things that are more selected. So the whiter things stay whiter and the darker things are being less selected. So if you were to go to like an L three, you can start to see it starts getting darker and darker. And so you can do the same with the mids and the darks. All these things are super helpful, but what I uh, want to show that I don't think it's shown as much is the color selection tool. So in this shot, so we have these two shots and I'm just going to stack them up together. I'm just going to hold the shift key and click and drag this warmer one on top of the cooler one. And I'm going to apply a mask to that uh, black mask. So that's going to temporarily disappear there. Um, and I'm assuming you guys can still see what I'm sharing here. Let me know if I should actually switch my share to Photoshop. No, we can see it. I can, can see, see what okay. you're doing. Yeah. All right, great. Uh, so what I'm going to do in Lumenzia. Oh, wait, is... actually, no, we cannot. No, I'm sorry. I can see, I only see capture one. I cannot see Lumenzia. Got it. I'll, I'll, I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to switch over to Photoshop. Okay. But can you see my palettes? I nope. Think you can. Nope. All we see right now is the office shot. Okay. So I'm gonna. I'm just gonna share the whole desktop. I think. What is that? And let me surface Photoshop. Okay. That should be. There you go. Good. Yep. That works. Okay. Uh, so. Anyway, so I, I stacked these two. We had these two uh, shots that came up. Um, this is the warmer version in which we're, we just want to use this little bit of the corner down here. So let's think if you wanted to just paint with this and you're like, I'll just freehand that. I don't need any fancy selection gizmos. Um, you would say, well, let me just come in here and I'll, I'll use a brush and I'll just start painting this and it'll be good enough. But before long, you realize that, well, now the chair bases are getting a little too yellow and the 
white part of the carpet's like a little too yellow and it's just not, it's not working so well. So what Lumenzia can do, so I just undid that. So with Lumenzia, somewhat similar to how Capture One, you can pick a color. I'm gonna use the color picker here and I'm gonna pick some of this blue carpet. And it's not gonna pick that part because I'm on the mask. Uh, I'm going to pick like somewhere like in a mid-tone of a blue. That might even be a little too dark. I'm just going to slide this up slightly because I want not just the dark blues, but I want sort of mid tony blues. So uh, I'm going to say OK, and then Lumenzi is going to do this little magic here, and it's going to show me what the, what the mask is of that blue selection. So kind of similar to what Capture One was doing, but just a little bit different. So... And you're thinking, well, that, that looks pretty subtle. I don't know if that's really going to do much. So from here, you in Lumenzi, you say select. So I'm going to make this into a selection. And then you come onto your mask. And the, the, the layer is, is filled with black right now. So none of this layer is showing, but we're going to paint with a brush. And I'm going to just do it quickly. I'm going to go do a brush at 100%. So in Lumenzi, when this SEL button is illuminated green, that means there's an active selection. But Greg has already put the command in there to hide the marching ants because when you have a, a really tedious selection, the marching ants are just too much. You can't even see what you're doing. So it's always, uh, it can trip you up a little bit if you're not, if you don't keep Lumenzia surfaced uh, to keep an eye on that SEL button to see if you have an active selection of some kind. Even if you have a path that you're not using with Lumenzia, if there's a path selection, this button will highlight. So it's helpful just to keep track of what you're doing with your selections. So right now, so right, black mask, uh, foreground colors, white, brush at 100%. And I'm just going to brush in this. And I'm just going to go over it a few times because you can actually get a little more out of it, even at 100%. So very quickly. And it's really like that. So and back here, there was some blue selection on that chair. There's a little bit of blue under this little toe kick here. It's a tiny bit of blue up in the ceiling. Some of that's probably not translating over Zoom. But just like that, and you see I'm painting super sloppy. I'm painting over these pink chairs, nothing's happening. I'm painting over these white cabinets, nothing's happening. Um, it's only looking at the blue stuff. And so this is a very well-constrained um, selection. So let me just turn that layer off. And I think what I'll do, just so you maybe see it a little better, I'll come down here, zoom it in like that. So I'll turn that off. And I'm hoping that's coming through over the zoom. But that carpet is much more neutral, and we didn't contaminate the chair bases with uh, like too much yellow from that much warmer shot. It really is very constrained to the carpet. So that's a really um, take the, one of these things where it takes longer to explain it than to do it. But now that carpet looks so much better, and that really that takes the shot from being like, okay, it's, it's all right, it's not really refined, into like, okay, that looks really nice. So, and so to me, th things like color consistency from left to right, top to bottom, across a ceiling, across a, a carpet like this, that's very important in order to translate the design and to make it look like a competent photograph where you're controlling the color and the light. So this is, um, this I think is a good example of, of that kind of thing. So those are just some tools. Um, maybe I can show you one other one I had teed up here. So similar thing. So I, I exported these from Capture One. So this shot, a uh, nice residential project near me. But the interior lighting at this time of day is just like too orangey. So, and it's also a little too bright in spots. So another, it's the same exact idea with Lumenzia. So I'm going to take a darker exposure where I've adjusted the color in Capture One so that the interior lighting looks good, but the exterior is too dark and isn't working very well. So there's one way to approach this is like, well, you could you could you could path out every window and cut them in, uh, which would take a long time, or you could use Lumenzia. So again, I'm just going to stack these two together pretty quickly. Uh, I'm going to put a black mask on this one. I'm going to close the other one we're not using. I'll make this bigger for you. So same, same um, logic applies here. So I want to select this time the yellowy stuff, the interior lighting. And the shot that we're going to paint through to is not only corrected, more corrected color, but it's also darker. So in, in essentially one move, we're going to bring in a better color and a darker exposure. 
So same idea, we're gonna use the picker, except I'm on the mask. I'm gonna use the picker and I'll pick right into the heart of that really saturated orangey ceiling there. And you can see the color it's picked. And now Lumenzi is gonna go through and make that selection for us. So you can see it's really well refined. It's not picking the window mullions. It's not picking, you know, a lot of the tree even in front of the window. So now it becomes very easy. I'm gonna make the selection, I'll hit the SEL button. Take a moment on these big files. So again, I'll use the brush. I'll just dive right into 100%. I might do it more subtly, uh, but just for purposes of example. So now I'm just painting. And again, I can paint really sloppily because the, the mask uh, has, has created a selection that's super constrained and easy to do. So. So very quickly, I've not only darkened, but changed the color of the interior. And just imagine what else you could do with that. This, this layer I'm painting in, I think looks more pleasing, but you could do something really crazy. You could have some really completely different thing being painted in there, but based on that selection of the yellow color. So in no time at all, we've taken, we've gone from this, which was too saturated and yellowy and bright down to this, which just looks to me much more neutral. So super quick. And the fun thing to do is uh, hit the option key and click on the mask. So there's the mask um, that we we just you know painted essentially. And if I keep painting, you'll see certain parts keep getting revealed because they're part of the selection that Lumenzia gave us. Even some of the trees in the background uh, are part of that color, so you just have to be careful in some sense. But so you can you can continue to paint on top of these masks um, even with 100% brush. Because until the mask is fully saturated through to 100% and pure white, uh, you can continue to paint on top of it. But you'll never like paint, oh, you keep painting over and over over the black parts, they will not ever turn white. But the parts that are sort of half selected, uh, you can continue to paint on top of. So that's, um, that's just another example there. And then, um, Frederick, how are we doing on time? We're we are good. So we're at the top of the hour, folks. So three minutes till the top of the hour. So we want to I think we want to continue and let you go forward, Jeffrey. So okay, if you sure. guys. Yeah, if you guys want to stick around for another 15 minutes or so as Jeffrey sort of walks through some of this stuff before we get to the Q&A, feel free to do so. But there will be a there'll be a replay of this as well. If you have to, you know, you've only budgeted an hour for this, there'll be a, there'll be a replay and you'll get that tomorrow. So. But we'll continue. So feel free, okay. Jeffrey, feel free to continue, you know, and until it's logical, elegant okay. conclusion. Sounds good. Thanks, Frederick. So mm -hmm. what I think I would do now, um, you know, we could go on post-production for, for months. <laughs> so, but I think what I'll do, I'll just show some other photos uh, and just tell you a few things about some of those photos that, that I had done. So I will, let's see here. We're going to stop this share and I'm going to go back to Keynote. I think it's here. There it is. All right, let me uh, see what's, yeah. So next I have for you uh, some residential projects. Uh, some or most of these might be on my website. I have to update the website, uh, but there's uh, definitely um, a lot on there uh, to talk about. So. I just want to go through and just show you some uh, some projects. I start with residential because I think a lot of people are interested in the residential uh, projects. So this is uh, down in Miami Beach. This is one of those little islands between the beach and the city. And uh, this was shot in July in the summer, obviously. But what was nice about doing this drone shot was that most of the neighbor's houses were dark because it's July in Miami. And most of these are second homes for people. So they're at their, uh, their summer home up north somewhere. So our, our house really stood out beautifully against, um, against the relatively dark neighborhood. So that was kind of a fun thing. Um, and then, so I'll just show you sort of like the series of photos of, of this house. Uh, so you get a sense of how I like to tell a story. And then, so we did uh, the drone shot it actually was done simultaneously uh, to some of these exterior dusk shots. Um, that's the nice thing about the drone. You can just stick it up in the air. And so this, uh, pretty straightforward in terms of th just about timing, uh, just being set up, like I said before, and getting the, the interior lighting on in the house. So I think we did two or three dusk shots on that particular night. 
Uh, this is a nice daylight shot. This is um, actually the architect of the house uh, in the pool. So he showed up to the shoot in his uh, swim trunks, ready to get in the pool. The cool thing about this pool is that it's actually on the second floor of the house and it's supported by columns below. So pretty cool. But this is, a, a, I think, a nice example of that one point perspective and an asymmetrical uh, one point perspective. So it's nice. You're right on axis with the pool, but you're just letting the house do its thing and the deck do its thing. Uh, interior, another one point perspective, also somewhat asymmetrical. Uh, switching gears a lot to a different style and location. So this is a, uh, a, one of these large, beautiful old town houses in Philadelphia, like a, you know, 10,000 square foot house. But this, um, what I like to talk about with these shots is a lot of the residential shoots will do with no artificial light on. And that also might be a difference with the architectural versus real estate. A lot of the real estate photos will definitely want to have all the lights on. I guess the, you know, for the general public, that makes a little more sense. People can feel that. But in the design world, uh, the last 10 years or so, it's been sort of a trend and pretty much established by Architectural Digest to leave the artificial lights off. And so, that, but that doesn't mean we're not adding other light. Uh, we made, and I have an example coming up, but this shot was actually done on a very dark day. And th my client was looking at me crazy and we're like, turn the lights off. Like you can't even see anything. So this is a, like a very long exposure, like I don't know, 10 or 15 or 20 seconds on a really, really dark day. Um, so mostly just daylight pouring in from the, from the windows and a little bit of strobe of ours added, um, just selectively. But here's an example I wanted to show. So on the left is a finished shot. Uh, that we have uh, same house and but in terms of when I talked earlier about uh, you know adding light for texture or mood or to move the eye around so that's where I saw an example here was that this is the shot with none of the strobe firing so at the top of the stairs you do get this little glow of light up here and that was kind of my inspiration for like well I think we should make that a much bigger glow and so a lot, a lot of times with stairs it, it feels weird if it's like darker upstairs because a lot of times you think about going upstairs or up you think about light and you feel like you want to go up to something. So I thought it'd be important to add the lighting up here. And that's just a strobe head that's bounced up at the top of the stairs, but it does a nice job illuminating the, the wood panels. And there's some other lights that we added uh, in the kitchen, uh, which do a nice job too, just to add some intentional, more intense reflection to the glass that's here. And I forget exactly which light it was, but also when you look through these stair treads, uh, sorry, through the risers, you can see a little more transparency than you can here. Uh, and so that's another important thing to add light to sort of differentiate materials and to show depth where they're, you know, so, cause they look, they look like they could be opaque here and they're not, they're, they're definitely uh, transparent grill work, uh, very meticulously done. And again, here on the on the edge of the stringer, there's a lot more detail that comes out than in this shot. So with just, I think, just two strobe heads, uh, we achieved a lot in terms of uh, bringing out a lot of detail and texture in those shots. This is the kitchen. Another one point and somewhat untraditional camera placement here. Um, if I was centered on the island, then all three of these lights kind of looked like one light, which was kind of strange. And the island looked more like a diving board than an island. So um, I decided to come off center on this one. And then a nice little breakfast nook shot. Nice sunlight pouring in. Uh, I don't think we did much lighting here except maybe around the windows. And I really like the shot. Again, another one point. You can see I like those. But just that the room just feels really, really comfortable and cozy to me. Nice bright morning. So we're trying to preserve the quality of light that the, that the natural light's bringing. And then we add light just to supplement or fill in shadows or balance. Uh, but one thing I think is important to know just how, how does sunlight really re react in a room? So you see this little shadow off of the wainscoting here, the chair row? That's a very natural shadow. That's not from us whatsoever, but it's just important to note that light does that sometimes. It does throw shadows upward uh, when the sun's bouncing off the floor. So it's important just to observe what sunlight does so you can discern whether something you're doing maybe is unrealistic or not. Bedroom. Again, there's just so much just daylight and the right exposure for that. Maybe some pops of strobe around the windows just to help post-production a little bit easier. But really like that sense of light pouring in across this rug here and the giving texture to the tufted backs of these chairs. Lots of color in the, 
in the uh, wall covering. Um, another really different house. This is a house that's just a few minutes from where I live. is a mid-century modern house uh, by Vincent Kling. And my client renovated this house. Uh, so this was really fun to shoot. Again, nice, uh, very sparingly furnished. Um, nice one point. This is where the one point perspective, I like to show this one. So if I had the camera turned left or right and more of a two point, you wouldn't really understand so much that this ceiling is, is a, a nice gentle uh, angle to it and another gentle angle up here. So, cause you'd be like, well, I don't know, that must be like the way the camera's pointed that's making those strange angles. But here you just let the camera be totally square to the building and let the building geometry do its thing. So I think this is a, a good example of that where the camera is not influencing how the building looks. Uh, this is just sort of letting it happen. And I think that's an important, uh, important distinction to make. Another shot. This one, we did do some lighting. You can see some evidence of it on these columns here, uh, lighting inside this room. Uh, this is uh, the same client of mine who did some renovation work to this very famous uh, Lucan building in Philadelphia. Really fun to shoot this building. Any architecture uh, geeks out there will know this building. Uh, Wharton Estra kitchen in that same building. So once again, lots of just daylight, uh, bringing, you know, letting the light even do the work on the ceiling. These are all natural shadows here. Just a really, really cool building. So newer furniture, older building. So we did some lighting in these, but it's just like strobe bounces here and there just to even out color a little bit. Uh, we're not making like this shadow here or any of these shadows, it's all natural shadows there. Uh, and a much different scale residential project is this building in Chicago that we shot a few years ago. Uh, still a, more of a yeah, multifamily residential, but still applying the same, the same daylight technique. Now this building has so much daylight on the right coming in that you can't really ignore it unless you just want to do like a, a, a nighttime shot. But this, um, yeah, just great shadows and light coming in here. A lot to do, a lot, lot more about scouting and figuring out what time to do the shot than actually executing the shot. So that's important too, is just understand when is it gonna look like this and, and how best to exploit that. And then some evening shots, same project. Uh, similar approach where you gotta anticipate which way, you know, the Western sky uh, often stays brighter, does stay brighter uh, after sunset. And so if you can find a shot that looks towards the Eastern sky, it's gonna be a much more dramatic, uh, darker blue sky. Something to think about there. I liked including the overhang here. So you feel like you're in a little bit of an enclosed space. It's fun. This totally handheld shot, just leaning out over the railing. Oh, I had these. Yeah, I skipped that section. So let me, uh, and then just a few more things here I'll show you. This was, uh, I shot the um, new Comcast Technology uh, Center in Philadelphia for Comcast a few years ago when it first opened this giant building here designed by Norman Foster, uh, really prominent on the Philadelphia skyline. And uh, the top third of it here is the new Four Seasons Hotel, which is really nice. So these are just some shots from around the city. Uh, in Philadelphia, in the summer months, you get light uh, sunlight on the north side of the building. So this is like end of the day. And this is sort of a nice mid-level shot. It's not a total skyline kind of a shot, but it's like the last one. But it's, you know, how does the, how does the building feel when you're just walking down the street? Um, so I thought this was a good example of that. And it also shows for a little bit of context is the, the, the first Comcast tower in Philadelphia. Uh, this is the lobby shot. Um, this is, you know, what you see, uh, the, it's a really spectacular entrance on 18th street. But what I think is what I wanted to, why I put this in the presentation, I was like to talk about dusk, you know, dusk is a nice, pretty time of day, but the, the time of year at dusk, you know, dusk the time changes constantly. So this was done in, in December of the year we shot this and before the pandemic. And uh, there's a lot of people on the street at like five o'clock uh, at dusk. So if you do the shot at 9.30 at night in June, there's very few people around. So that's just one of those little things that's helpful to try to understand about, well, you know, how come, how did you get all these people here? And maybe you're thinking of dusk and summertime, but this was dusk and wintertime. And um, really great cobblestone street, really nice reflection of lights off the street. Interior shot. 
Um, no lighting in this kind of a shot. This is just all ambient because there's just so much of it. Similar here, we had a little bit of strobe fill here and there, uh, but mostly setting up furniture. Again, another one point perspective where I think the building, the building's doing the work. The camera's just the letting letting it do it. In terms of the cross bracing here and how the these you know three levels of the building stack up and the angle of the glass here, so it just really allows it to take some shape. The theme here should have been one points. So here's another one. So in this case, I'm, I'm lined up. So I have a ceiling element here. So you know, it's a, a, it's sort of an asymmetrical one point perspective. I do like to try to find something to line up to, uh, because I think if you were off center on this one panel, it would start to feel a little weird. So I, I'm centered on this panel, right all the way down there. So that's the center point of my shot. And I think that just helps so once again, organize the shot. So you as the photographer have to give a point of organization about which the shot can can take shape. And this was uh, all about timing, getting in there. Maybe the 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 lunch start service at maybe eleven thirty in the morning. So we're in there at eleven. Camera set up. Um, made sure the sun was out, and then just just shooting some of the staff because once this gets overwhelmed with people, it's going to just be mayhem. Uh, this is the same building. This is their town hall space. Um, full control of daylight in here. So we did the shot a couple of different ways with daylight, with not daylight, but this is just the, the shades closed, artificial lights only. Uh, let's see, be able to show you this project and then we can do some Q and A. Uh, this is a very unusual structure. I can't quite call it a building. It's an amphitheater. It's down in Columbia, Maryland. And I was asked to shoot it by one of the developers that built it. And so it's, you know, it's basically a music venue. So it was a challenge to shoot because you kind of had to throw out a lot of the traditional ways of like, well, where's the sun going to be and these kinds of things, because it's a very unusual shape of a structure and it's not a traditional building with, with four walls and a roof. So it had its challenges in, in that regard. And I always work with an assistant, like almost always, always. But this particular shoot, I actually decided not to work with an assistant because I, I wasn't sure um, what it was going to be. I felt like I was just going to try a million different options. And I just kind of felt like I just wanted to be in my own headspace and try and just work it out, uh, on my own. And, and it's a small enough site that I can move around easily enough. So some of these shots in the evening were in fact done in the evening, but also I knew I wanted several of these kinds of shots. And so I asked the, the people who managed the place, I said, could I, uh, I'm going to come back really early in the morning. So can we, um, get the lights on super early. So they were able to keep the lights on for me. So I came back and did some at, at, at um, dusk and then came back at dawn uh, and did some more. So um, this was a, a nice shot and um, ended up on the cover of Architect Magazine, which was cool. And they wouldn't tell us if it was gonna be on the cover or not, but they did ask us to add a little bit more sky. So I'm like, okay, I guess it's gonna be on the cover. So we could do lots of fun little details about how this thing is put together. And it's just really fun to try and capture these kinds of moments where, again, I'm trying to let the geometry speak for itself. So it's not necessarily a one point perspective, but I'm paying attention to how things overlap. And so I wanted to see this whole shape here. And then the, you know, this whole shape is on top of that one and there's space on either side of this one. So it's a lot of thought give, given to that. And this is what I mean about sort of a, a non-traditional time of day. I, I would rarely shoot directly into the sun at dawn. Um, you know, looking at the opposite side of a building, but this doesn't have a wall, so you can just look right through it. So these kinds of things are, are fun to shoot when they come up. And some really nice details to play with different times of day through the trees. I like how the tree is straight, but the building isn't. And then uh, one shot there uh, during a performance, which is fun. They were playing the theme Star Wars which was cool. So I think that's probably a good spot to stop. There's a million other things I can show you, but we only have so much time. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Frederick, if you want to move into any uh, Q and A.
Absolutely. Yeah. No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. This is a really good presentation. I got lots of notes uh, and some questions in here. So before we dive into the questions, um, just FYI, folks that are you folks that are watching this, there's going to be a replay. So the replay will go out uh, probably tomorrow afternoon-ish, if I can get to it. Um, but no later than tomorrow evening, the replay will go out, provided it recorded. Um, also, I want to thank the DVE store for you know, helping us put this thing on. So thank you, DVE store. And also a reminder, uh, Jeff's workshop is coming up next week. I'm mentioning it again at the end because it's next week and it's a live workshop. It's not a recording. So if you want to participate in that, the link will be in the replay that I send you out tomorrow night. Uh, and then lastly, this everything that we do here, including this presentation and all of our courses and the course that Jeffrey's going to be doing for, for the TWIP community, that's all available to you if you are a TWIP member already. So you know where to go to, to find the courses within the community. So this course will be, the course that he puts together will be inside of there as well. So if you want to be a, a member of the TWIP community, get access to this course that he's putting together and all the future ones and all the ones that are already in there, um, just go to join.thisweekinphoto.com. I'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, and normally we well, I'm, I'm tr in 2022 i've been trying to standardize on doing these events on thursdays jeffrey had some commitments um this week which precluded us from doing it on thursday but normally these will when they happen they'll happen thursday evening around this time so just keep an eye out for those um so let's dive into the questions and then we'll wrap this thing up uh the first question is from stephen sharf what's up stephen Steven says, uh, can you show where do you find the normalize tool in Capture One again, please? Yes, I will show that. So I honestly do not even know where it natively lives, but I will show you how to find it. So the easiest way in Capture One to find any tool, if you can't find it, is to just add it to whatever tool palette, you, tool tab you happen to be on uh, or where you'd like it to be. So you can go to the view menu, customize tools, add tool to exposure tab in this case. And then every tool that Capture One has will show up in this flyout menu. So you can just pick normalize and it'll pop itself in there. And then you can move it around. You can say, well, you know, okay, I added it here, but I really want to put it in the color tab because it's more related to color. So I can just stick it in there like that. So there's lots of nice little inter user interface things with Capture One that you can do. So, uh, yeah, that's how you would find or add any tool. Cool. All right. And next up is Michael Rhino. Hey, Michael. Michael says, as a workflow, do you typically make your initial edits in Capture One and then bring them into Photoshop to make luminosity mask adjustments in Luminzia? Uh, excellent question. So the basic workflow I do is I do as much as I can in Capture One. So I'm going to make um, all the color adjustments and you know, tone adjustments, uh, anything to do with uh, you know, levels, curves, I'll do that as best as I can see in Capture One. And so I bring things into Photoshop mostly when I'm going to do any kind of compositing or if there's, there's some sort of other control that I want to do that maybe Lumencia is good at. Uh, as good as Capture One is, that doesn't quite have a tool like Lumencia that is as precise. Yeah. So uh, a lot of times it'll just be, you know, fine tune as much as possible, get it as good as I can get. And maybe it's a series of brackets, right? So maybe it's like three brackets I want to blend together. So I'll work on the primary one and then I'll copy those adjustments, to the other two and bring those three shots, uh, into Photoshop and then we'll composite it together. Or it's often the case that we have people in the shots. So I usually shoot the whole shot without people first, and then we'll add the people in. So I may be doing, uh, some Photoshop compositing just to add the people, for instance. So, uh, I do as much as I can in, in Capture One. And Capture One keeps getting better and better at what it can do. Yeah, I was curious about that. Some of those, some of those urban shots that you were showing, and mm -hmm. you know, of common areas, like the the logistics to get the people out of there for enough time <laughs> for you to make the shot. How does that work? Like, are you or are you doing like some median command to make sure that you just you know oh, you mean get like rid of all the people? When you say urban shot, they mean it's some of the like uh, city kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly, it's just it's just sort of waiting around, or you know, just doing a variety of shots, either to add people or sometimes to take people away. 
Uh, yeah. So it's um, it's yeah, it could go either way. Sometimes uh, sometimes there aren't enough people around, so you shoot one exposure with that person, one over here, one over there, and then composite that together to make to make. But that one evening shot of the Comcast building, for instance, that was all just live one group of people at a time, uh, or you know that was in that one capture. So that that was beneficial in that regard. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. All right, a couple more shots here, and then we'll wrap up. Stephen Sharp mm -hmm. says, I note that the interior lights are off. Real estate lights lights on, which I personally do not like. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a rule in architectural photography that you that the scenes must have the you know like table lamps off and that sort of thing? Typically, yeah, it's it's most 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 often the case, uh, and it's I like it visually because it, it, then it really lets the daylight come through nicely, mm -hmm. uh, so you can really let the daylight do more work. Because if you make an exposure. It's not always the case, but you make an exposure long enough to let the daylight do the work. The artificial lights could be really, really blown out yeah, uh, and then hard to control. But the other thing to keep in mind is the color difference. So when you have uh, daylight pouring in through lots of windows and then you have like these yellow lamps on the on the table and then the, the lampshade throws that funny scallop shape on the wall and that's like a yellow weird shadow and it just, it just starts to look a little little funny to my eye. Yeah. So the only time we'll, we'll put... Um, uh, interior artificial light on, you know, maybe there's a real spectacular chandelier or some art light or something like that, that, you know, mm -hmm. that benefits from being on, but often we'll do it two way. We'll do it. We'll shoot it with and without. And so I might sort of turn on the light in post. So it looks like it's on, but we may not allow it to contaminate the space. So we might just keep it isolated to where it looks like it's on, but it's not really doing any work. And what's your what's your previs workflow? You mentioned sort of you you go on site with the client and walk through and get their idea of what their shot what the shots are going to be. And after you after you do that, that's, I'm I'm guessing that's kind of a one day couple hour kind of thing. Yeah, do you yeah, hour you take that sure. knowledge back home and your iPhone shots or whatever you did, mm -hmm. and then sort of review them and sketch it out? Or what's what's the process that that prepares you to go there with a crew to create this level of work? Sure. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So we'll, we'll schedule a time, uh, to go meet with the client and usually the client will bring, you know, one or two or three people that are, um, relevant to the project. And that's where we'll have the discussions about like, what are the, what are the important goals here? So if it's a whole new building, it's kind of obvious that they want to capture the whole building, but it might be a renovation project. It might be, uh, a single floor in an office building, uh, something like that. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's real obvious that they want to capture the big glitzy shots, but sometimes it's a little more subtle about, um, you know, how this particular office works. So we'll, th I'll have that sort of discussion about, you know, you show me what, what's important. They may have sent ahead of time, like a floor plan that mm -hmm. has like eight shots or something sketched out on it. They're like, we want one here, one there, one there. And then we'll go and look at it and try and figure out, well, okay, they wanted one shot of the pantry area, but it, you know, maybe it needs two shots or maybe it's not worth a shot at all or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, so I'll just grab a, a bunch of different snapshots just handheld and then um i'll send them a pdf uh later and then they'll like you know a couple days before the shoot if i haven't heard from them otherwise then we'll we'll really start to say like all right which what shots do you want to pursue and you know what do we need do we need any additional styling or props or do you want people and, and who are the people where are they coming from are they staff members from your office are they people who live or work in the building do they know we're coming? Do they want to be in the photos? <laughs> right. You know, right. So there's a lot of those little things because people are great to have in photos, but it's really like it can be a problem. Like, well, who are they? <laughs> yeah. Who yeah. That's and how, do, how does the billing piece work of that? Like, do you are you billing by the shot or by the building or just by the hour? How do, how do you handle that? Uh, I break it down by a, a creative fee. Mm -hmm. And that can be um, I, I do a, a half day, full day kind of a scenario. So, mm -hmm. but I, I cap uh, a, a half a day shoot at five shots. Okay. So if we, if we start doing six, seven, eight shots, that even if we do them in f three, four hours, because maybe it's a quick shoot, I don't want to be penalized for being quick and efficient right. uh, in terms of time. So I don't like to tie it to time so much. So the word half day, full day, like kind of translates to people who aren't, you know, if I'm talking to advertising people who understand the language of a photo estimate, then we speak in different terms. Yeah. But when I'm talking to, you know, relative lay people in terms of the photography world, like even, you know, my clients, even though they're savvy architects, they don't necessarily speak photo estimate language. So right. I stick with like half day, full day kind of thing. But like I said, so if we get to, be, we get to say the sixth shot, it gets a little awkward. I'm like, all right, we're stepping into the full day rate here. Um, so I try mm -hmm. and make that clear ahead of time. No one really pushes back on it. It's just the notion that 
that you know six shots cost more than five um in the sense yeah. there's a post-production shot per charge too but in terms of the fee because i like to explain it like this say well say um i shot a building for the architect we did 10 shots the contractor comes to me six months later and says i'd like to license five of those shots from you i say okay well here's a shot a, a price per shot and they'll say okay that sounds good I'll, I'll take those five shots and nowhere in that conversation is well how long did that shot take you to do <laughs> yeah. you know did that take yeah. an hour that looks like a 15 minute shot you yeah. know i don't think you spent that much time on that so that that never comes up so the value of the photographs really has nothing to do with the time spent it can yeah. feel like it like if you if you go in and you shoot 20 shots in a, in a half day um because all the conditions were right because you scouted ahead of time maybe you got fortunate the building is really organized um you have your experience you bring a good assistant or two and it's efficient and you get it done uh at the end of the day the client walks away with 20 really good shots and i don't you know they're usually not thinking about well it only it didn't take all that long you know but because yeah. there's still a lot of other stuff to do <laughs> and there's a lot that went in ahead of time so yeah and i i, I you know what you said at the beginning of your talk about how what you're doing is capturing in many cases the the architect's life work life's work right mm -hmm. so you're creating a portfolio piece for them like who's going to nickel and dime their portfolio piece right <laughs> so yeah you oh, know it's true. a, it's a different kind of client i'm guessing like where mm -hmm. You know, if it's a different genre of photography, yeah, well, maybe can I, can I shave off at like a wedding, right? Can I shave off an hour here or <laughs> we don't really need you for the reception. Get out of here, right? So right, right, right. and save yeah. a couple of bucks. But if, if I've worked forever to create this amazing permanent or semi-permanent piece of real estate, you know, the, the photography is it's kind of like putting cheap tires on an expensive sports car right if you're gonna right, right. cheap out yeah. on the photography right 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 and it's not that all my clients are like just spending money it's like there are plenty of clients who, who often just stick to a half day scenario so yeah. they'll do we want to stick with that um we can usually tell the story of our projects in five shots or maybe less and you know and that's fine and then there are others who just have maybe larger scale projects that just require more but yeah um so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm just like disregarding people's budgets and things. It's like we, we make it work, but it's just uh, yeah. it's just how that's sort of the the pace and the 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 amount of photos produced in a certain period of time uh, in terms of like a, a full day shoot or something is kind of understood um, by most architects and what they what can they they can expect. Somebody calls me up and that I don't recognize or it sounds like they're not you know not used to hiring a photographer, one of the first questions I'll ask is like, well, how many, how many shots are you thinking of? And if it's a three digit number, um, <laughs> then I'm like, <laughs> they're like, some people, well, I don't know, a couple hundred and we'll pick, we'll pick five or six good ones. I'm like, I'll tell you what, why don't we just shoot five or six good ones? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's, That's good. Calling That's a photographer, good. you know, it's like, <laughs> exactly. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. You're not panning for gold here. You're we're creating That's art. A way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, two more sh two more questions, and then we'll break. Uh, Stephen okay. Sharf says, Jeff, you're shooting commercial architecture in a city on public streets. Does the city require a permit? Some businesses get upset when they see a camera on a tripod. So true. Excellent question. Uh, and uh, this, and I, I'm no lawyer, but as far as I understand, well, certainly in Philadelphia, you don't need a. Uh, a permit for a tripod uh, on the street. Um, you do need for, if you're getting into a larger production, uh, and larger, I just mean like more things on the street, then you do need uh, oftentimes a permit. Um, and in terms of businesses and cameras and things, yeah, people can be sensitive about that, but unfortunately the law is not really in their favor. Um, so you're technically allowed, and I've did do some research on this, you're technically allowed to take a photograph of anything from a public space. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a public street, you can point your camera at anything. Now there's there's lines about, you know, using a 600 millimeter lens trying to look into somebody's window. Mm -hmm. That's you know, maybe a, a, certainly a violation there. But if you're just taking a photograph of what's on the street, um, you know, within reasonable limits, then you don't need any kind of permit. You may find, or permission, uh, you may find that someone may, might get a little antsy about something. Um, but you know, usually just try and talk your way out of it. Yeah. Um, and then there are times when permits can uh, certainly help you, like trying to get uh, parking restrictions in, at least in Philadelphia, I'm most familiar with doing that. If we wanna, well, I was just scouting a house last week where there's, there's street parking in front of the house. And so we're planning to contact the city of Philadelphia's uh, film production office, and they can uh, work with the city to issue a permit to allow us to post those temporary no parking signs. 
and then hopefully hopefully no one parks there but in a residential area it can be really hit and miss yeah. so um so yeah sometimes we work with the city to try and facilitate uh, parking restrictions which can be helpful. just do your homework make sure you have a smooth uneventful day on yeah and so, yeah. so you can concentrate <laughs> on the photography and the light right yeah um next one is from jim everett jim says is uh oh i did not mean to do that it's my crazy mouse. Uh, Jim says, do you use gradient masks or mm -hmm. gradient mask luminosity for uh, in post for natural light interiors, diffused streaming side light in daylight? I'm not sure I understand Well, the that. first part I was saying yes. Let me read it again. Let me read it again. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read it verbatim, Jim Everett. It says, do you use gradient masks luminosity in post for natural light interiors with diffuse streaming side light in daylight. I think I know he's getting that. So <laughs> perhaps there's, well, I would, I do use gradient masks a lot and I use that in uh, capture one. Um, mostly that's where I'll mostly use that. And that is, um, um, I can just show very, very quickly. Uh, oops, sorry. Let me just share that real fast there. So I'll show it um, with maybe this shot here. So sorry, all my tools are not where I usually have them. So I'm going to make a new layer. So it's making a new adjustment layer there. And I'm going to hit the M key to show a mask. And there's a gradient tool to make a mask that's a gradient. And then so I can, so let's say I wanted to correct that blue thing in the corner. It's a different way, you know, it's not going to be as good, but so I just drew a mask there. That's a gradient. I'll turn off the, uh, the mask that we can see and I'll just quickly go to like, uh, here and let's just say I just wanted to warm up. So I'm just sliding, just doing a color temperature adjustment, right? Like that roughly. So I can toggle that on and off. So that's just a, a sort of just, just like it says, it's a gradient of a mask that goes from a hundred percent to 0% out to this white line that's here. So yeah, those are super helpful for, I use them and, and it's not just exposure, like here I use it for color. So mm -hmm. that's something really uh, helpful to keep in mind is that the gradient, it, you can't do normalize with the gradient, unfortunately, because you can't use it on a layer. But anything in Capture One that um, once you're on a new layer has this little paintbrush next to the tool, um, that's something that you can then use on that layer. But um, normalize does not have that. So yes, to gradients. Uh, the rest of it, I, th I think you're just trying to point to a particular example with light coming in, or maybe you're trying to control the intensity of something. So yeah. this this is a, a a good tool to to try to do that. Very cool. That chair there. All right, and the final yeah. question, also from Jim Everett, he says, "My wife is an interior designer and likes the likes the interior lights on to showcase her design aesthetic and create the experience of being in the space." So that's kind of rhetorical, but you're 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 saying that the norm in architectural photography is lights off, right? Correct. Yeah, and the alternative, if you really want to show, like when I shoot for lighting designers, a lot of times we're shooting at um, even in the interior, we might be shooting at dusk. Mm -hmm. So uh, what that does is that just diminishes the daylight to potentially like a nice glow of light um, in the window. And then it's, um, you know, I could show it if we have time for one other example here. Yeah, let's go. Let's close with that one. <laughs> I think it's, uh, I keep forgetting I have to share my screen. And I will try to find this. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not there. Something I shot just uh, last week or the week before. So this was an actual shoot, just real quick here. That, that what I'm looking for is a shot where I d actually did it both ways, like a pure daylight shot. Mm -hmm. And then it was actually toward the end of the day. And then without, you know, not a minute went by, I just uh, switched the lights on and it became it became like an interior dusk kind of a setup and I'll be there in a second. Here we go. So here is on the right, I'll make this a little bigger. On the right, uh, these are done at virtually the same time of day, right? We can't but, see it. We can't see oh, your screen. Okay. Hmm. Thought I shared it. 
There you there go. Goes. Um, so on the right hand side, uh, these were done back to back immediately. No, no time waiting in between. So this is all the interior lights off. Right. And it's, and it's, you can see in the left hand shot, it's definitely toward the end of the day, <laughs> except that all the light pouring in here is that bluish color. Um, except that it's color balanced to look more neutral. Yeah. Right. And then the shot on the left, again, just, these are just back to back. Um, this is turn the interior lights on. Right. And now I'm exposing for, uh, less time. So the shot on the right was two seconds and the shot on the left is a half a second. Um, under the same amount of daylight essentially, but now on the left side, it's doing a lot more work. So my point to his question is, uh, you could pick a time of day like this where, uh, the, the, uh, daylight it has a much more minimal look. I wouldn't do it at night because then the ruin windows just get really, they're black and reflective. Mm -hmm. uh, they reflect what's inside the room and it doesn't, it just feels like night. It feels like it doesn't feel as, as welcoming. So you, you could consider doing shots at, at like this time of day. Uh, or the alternative is, um, you know, just again, just doing the, the, the full on daylight. But what I did in post-production for this shot, um, was, and the reason I shot this with the lights on, on the left-hand side was to blend the lighting into this shot. And mm -hmm. by blend it in, I mean, just make the fixtures look like they're on. Mm -hmm. Right. But they're not, but I'm not blending in like this, this spill of light on the wall here or the, the patterns that the lights make on the floor. I'm just sort of just turning on that little ring, just turning on these little dots of light to make it look like they're on. Um, and that's just to, you know, just to give it, give it a little bit more of that feel. So you could do the left-hand shot where it's, uh, like an interior dusk. You could do the right-hand shot, like where it's no lights, or you could blend the two together. So you have the prettiness of the daylight and the right-hand shot, but you add, you make it look like the light fixtures are on. Um, and that doesn't always work. Like you're not going to, sometimes it's hard to blend that together, but, um, in this kind of case where it's just individual fixtures and things, then it can work. So that might be a good solution is to, is like shoot it both ways and mm -hmm. then, and blend it together a little bit. It's the, the magic of using a really high quality and sturdy tripod, right? So yes. Tripods yeah. are underrated in that regard. <laughs> mm -hmm. No registration errors. Um, Jeff, last question, just from me: um, Are most of your shots shot in the four three aspect ratio, and is that an industry standard for architectural photography? Uh, I don't. No, it's definitely not an industry standard. Uh, I again, going back to the film days, I always like the four to five proportion. That's what you know, four by five film. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know almost almost square. Um, the camera sensor in the phase one camera is four to three, and same in the in the Fuji, I believe. And I've never been a big fan of the the two to three aspect ratio uh, of your you know, normal uh, DSLR or mirrorless camera, because I find in I'm often you know it gives you plenty of width in most cases, but the height seems very restricted. Yeah. So it feels like okay, I have a 50 megapixel camera, but um, the the width is good, but I need to go to a wider lens to get the height that I want, and then I have to crop in on the left and the right. So I've just lost a bunch of pixels because I'm having to like go wider and crop in. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah um, no. Totally. So cool. the four to three aspect on the phase one back is, is nice because I, I'm, um, I rarely feel like I'm having to make that kind of move. And we, I crop, there's plenty of shots I do more panoramic. I may crop to two to three in mm -hmm. many instances or even 16 by nine. Um, but I do like st sticking with that four to three, four to five, uh, yeah. more often. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, we went about 38 minutes over, which I think was not wasted. Okay. This was good. <laughs> All right, <terrific>. <laughs> <laughs> this was really good. Uh, I didn't want to stop you. So, um, yeah, folks, thanks for thanks for showing up for this. Jeffrey, you have any any final thoughts you want to throw out before we end the webinar? No, I just uh, um, I always enjoy coming on, Frederick. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of my experiences with folks. And if people want to get in touch uh, about, you know, about anything, it just um, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to reach out. My website's just uh, jeffreytotaro.com. And um, I'm Jeffrey Totaro on Instagram. And if you, uh, yeah, if you want to take, come out and take the workshop next week, I think it's, um, it's definitely a lot of information passed from me to you <laughs> through mm -hmm. uh, about four hours a day for, for four days. Uh, now is that, is that in, that's virtual or in person? It's virtual this year. It's virtual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Next yeah. year we're hoping it was meant to be in person this year, but we switched it uh, about a month ago to be virtual again. Yeah. So, um, yeah, in person is really fun. We go to Palm beach, Florida for, and that's five days. Um, and there we spend about half a day out shooting and half a day in the classroom doing post or talking about other things. And, um, it's always Can fun. You... We always get people from all over. 
can you put the link to that in the chat? Stephen Sharf is asking where he can sign up for that. So uh, sure. it'll be it'll be in the replay email, Stephen. But you know, just in case you want to go dive into it right now, we'll put it in here. Yeah, and then we'll end with that. Thank you for asking that. Coming up. Um, yeah, the workshop's really, um, it's a lot of fun. I've, I've met many people um, that I'm yeah, still friends with and in touch with um, over the years. So, And there's been many people have taken it more than once, too, which is kind of fun. Cool. Yeah, well, you can use this one as a, as a primer for the in-person in 2023, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping we get, <laughs> get back in person. I mean, the online ones is, is fun, but it's a... Uh, it's a, it's, I, I say it, it, it gives you a lot more, there's a lot more information conveyed because it's just like me just talk, 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 and lots of showing ex examples. Whereas in person is like, yeah, we're going to go out and do some shooting together and we're going to, um, you know, talk about uh, like how to approach it. We all work together on one shot at a time. So, yeah, yeah. in person is more about out shooting. And uh, the virtual one is more about a lot more about the um, examples I have to show of how we did things because I don't think it's efficient to try and show a shoot virtually. Right, um, right. I think there'd be a lot of. Do you, do you talk about the business side of things in the yeah. in the workshop as well? Okay. Yeah, we talk about all the boring stuff. You know, like the you know even like insurance and you know other you know business related matters and working with assistants and. Um, and certainly nuts and bolts of how to put together an estimate and what things to think about. And, you know, post-production is a big thing. I, I don't, um, I always get the feeling that people aren't charging enough for post-production because there's a lot of time spent there. Some yeah. people like to ro roll it in to uh, just a day flat fee or something. And trust me, your client's thinking, well, if I can get 10 shots out of them, it's the same cost as five. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's, <laughs> you don't want your client thinking that. Um, so there's, there's a lot to talk about with that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, there's a link, folks. And yep. uh, yeah, this will, that link will be in, the, in the, the email I send out. But we'll leave it right there. Thank you, everybody, for cool. coming and sticking in with us. Thank you, Jeffrey Totaro, for an Thank amazing you, presentation. Uh, that was really good. If that was a preview of what you're doing in that workshop, it'll be time well spent, I think. All right, great. So, I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Okay. All right. All right, everybody. You have a good rest of your evening or day, depending on where you are. And we'll see you next time. All right. This is Twitter.